the prince. So prince. Machiavelli, Niccolo, Niccolo. The Prince by Niccolo Machiavelli, translated by Marriott Contents, Introduction, Youth 8, 125, 14, 69, 94, Office 8, 25, 43, 14, 94, 15, 12, Literature, and Death 8. 43, 58, 15, 12, 27, The Man and His Works, Dedication, The Prince, Chapter I. How many kinds of principalities there are, and by what means they are acquired, Chapter I. Concerning hereditary principalities, Chapter I. A. Concerning mixed principalities, Chapter I. Why the kingdom of Darius, conquered by Alexander, did not rebel against the successors of Alexander at his death, Chapter V. Concerning the way to govern cities or principalities which lived under their own laws before they were annexed, chapter by. Concerning new principalities which are acquired by one's own arms and ability, chapter by. Concerning new principalities which are acquired either by the arms of others or by good fortune, chapter by. Concerning those who have obtained a principality by wickedness, chapter X. Concerning a civil principality, chapter X. C. Concerning the way in which the strength of all principalities ought to be measured, chapter Xi. Concerning ecclesiastical principalities, chapter Xi. How many kinds of soldiery there are, and concerning mercenaries, chapter Xi. Concerning auxiliaries, mixed soldiery, and one's own, chapter Xi. That which concerns a prince on the subject of war, chapter X. Concerning things for which men, and especially princes, are praised or blamed, Chapter XV. Concerning liberality and meanness, Chapter XVI. Concerning cruelty and clemency, and whether it is better to be loved than feared, Chapter XVI. Concerning the way in which princes should keep faith, Chapter VI. That one should avoid being despised and hated, Chapter X. Are fortresses, and many other things to which princes often resort, advantageous or hurtful, Chapter XVI. How a prince should conduct himself so as to gain renown, Chapter XI. Concerning the secretaries of princes, Chapter XI. How flatterers should be avoided, Chapter XI. Why the princes of Italy have lost their states, Chapter XI. What fortune can affect in human affairs and how to withstand her, Chapter XI. An exhortation to liberate Italy from the barbarians' description of the methods adopted by the Duke Valentino when murdering Vitello Zovitelli. A Livrato de Fermo, the Signor Pagolo, from 1494 to 1512 held an official post at Florence which included diplomatic missions to various European courts. Imprisoned in Florence, 1512, later exiled and returned to San Casciano. Died at Florence on 22 June 1527. Introduction Niccolo Machiavelli was born at Florence on 3 May 1469. He was the second son of Bernardo di Niccolo Machiavelli, a lawyer of some repute, and of Bartolome di Stefano Nelli, his wife. Both parents were members of the old Florentine nobility. His life falls naturally into three periods, each of which singularly enough constitutes a distinct and important era in the history of Florence. His youth was concurrent with the greatness of Florence as an Italian power under the guidance of Lorenzo di Medici, Il Magnifico. The downfall of the Medici in Florence occurred in 1494, in which year Machiavelli entered the public service. During his official career, Florence was free under the government of a republic, which lasted until 1512, when the Medici returned to power, and Machiavelli lost his office. The Medici again ruled Florence from 1512 until 1527, when they were once more driven out. This was the period of Machiavelli's literary activity and increasing influence, but he died within a few weeks of the expulsion of the Medici, on 22 June 1520. Youth, Act. 125, 14, 69, 94, although there is little recorded of the youth of Machiavelli, the Florence of those days is so well known that the early environment of this representative city, Florence has been described as a city with two opposite currents of life, one directed by the fervent and austere Savonarola, 
the other by the splendor loving Lorenzo. Savonarola's influence upon the young Machiavelli must have been slight, for although at one time he wielded immense power over the fortunes of Florence, he only furnished Machiavelli with a subject whereas the magnificence of the Medician rule during the life of Lorenzo appeared to have impressed Machiavelli strongly, for he frequently recurs to it in his writings, and it is to Lorenzo's grand Machiavelli in his history of Florence, gives us a picture of the young men among whom his youth was passed. He writes, They were freer than their forefathers in dress and living, and spent more in other kinds of excesses, consuming their time and money in idleness, gaming and women. There he writes, I have received your letter, which has given me the greatest pleasure, especially because you tell me you are quite restored in health, than which I could have no better news. Therefore, my son, if you wish to please me, and to bring success and honor to yourself, do write and study, because others will help you if you help yourself. Office 2543 1494-1512 The second period of Machiavelli's life was spent in the service of the Free Republic of Florence, which flourished, as stated, after serving four years in one of the public offices, he was appointed Chancellor and Secretary to the Second Chancery, the Ten of Liberty and Peace. Here we are on firm ground when dealing with the events of Machiavelli's life, for during this time he took a leading part in the affairs of the Republic and we have its decrees, records, a mere recapitulation of a few of his transactions with the statesmen and soldiers of his time gives a fair indication of his activities, and supplies the sources from which he drew the experiences and His first mission was in 1499 to Catherine of Sforza, my lady of Forley of the Prince, from whose conduct and fate he drew the moral that it is far better to earn the confidence of the people. This is a very noticeable principle in Machiavelli, and is urged by him in many ways as a matter of vital importance to princes. In 1500 he was sent to France to obtain terms from Louis Xia for continuing the war against Pisa. This king it was who, in his conduct of affairs in Italy, committed the fight. He also, it was who made the dissolution of his marriage a condition of support to Pope Alexander V., which leads Machiavelli to refer those who urge that such promises should be kept to what Machiavelli's public life was largely occupied with events arising out of the ambitions of Pope Alexander Vi and his son, Césaire Borgia, the Duke Valentino, and the Machiavelli never hesitates to cite the actions of the Duke for the benefit of usurpers who wish to keep the states they have seized. He can, indeed, find no precepts to offer so good as the Yet, in the prince the duke is in point of fact cited as a type of the man who rises on the fortune of others and falls with them, who takes every course that might be expected from a prudent man but the court. On the death of Pius I.A., in 1503, Machiavelli was sent to Rome to watch the election of his successor, and there he saw Césaire Borgia cheated into allowing the choice. Machiavelli, when commenting on this election, says that he who thinks new favors will cause great personages to forget old injuries deceives himself. Julius did not rest until he had ruined Césaire. It was to Julius I that Machiavelli was sent in 1506, when that pontiff was commencing his enterprise against Bologna, which he brought to a successful issue, as he did many. It is in reference to Pope Julius that Machiavelli moralizes on the resemblance between fortune and women and concludes that it is the bold rather than the cautious man that will win and hold them both. It is impossible to follow here the varying fortunes of the Italian states, which in 1507 were controlled by France, Spain, and Germany, with results that have lasted. He had several meetings with Louis Caia of France, and his estimate of that monarch's character has already been alluded to. Machiavelli has painted Ferdinand of Aragon as the man who accomplished great things under the cloak of religion, but who in reality had no mercy, faith, humanity, or integrity. The Emperor Maximilian was one of the most interesting men of the age, and his character has been drawn by many hands, but Machiavelli, who was an envoy at his court in 1507 8 the remaining years of Machiavelli's official career were filled with events arising out of the League of Cambrai, 
made in 1508 between the three Greek European powers already mentioned and the this result was attained in the Battle of Vela, when Venice lost in one day all that she had won in 800 years. Florence had a difficult part to play during these events, complicated as they were by the feud which broke out between the Pope and the French, because friendship with France had dictated the entire policy. When, in 1511, Julius I finally formed the Holy League against France, and with the assistance of the Swiss drove the French out of Italy. Florence lay at the mercy of the return of the Medici to Florence on 1st September 1512, and the consequent fall of the Republic, was the signal for the dismissal of Machiavelli and his friends, and the literature and death. At 4358-1512-27 on the return of the Medici, Machiavelli, who for a few weeks had vainly hoped to retain his office under the new masters of Florence, was dismissed. Shortly after this he was accused of complicity in an abortive conspiracy against the Medici, imprisoned and put to the question by torture. The new Medici Pope, Leox, procured his release, and he retired to his small property at San Cascina near Florence, where he devoted himself to literature. In a letter to Francisco Vettori, dated 13 December 1513, he has left a very interesting description of his life at this period, which elucidates his methods and his After describing his daily occupations with his family and neighbors, he writes, The evening being come, I return home and go to my study at the entrance I pull off my piece, and because Dan says, Knowledge doth come of learning well retained, unfruitful else, I have noted down what I have gained from their conversation, and have composed a small work on Filippo Casavaccio has seen it. He will be able to tell you what is in it, and of the discourses I have had with him. Nevertheless, I am still enriching and polishing it. Various mental influences were at work during its composition. Its title and patron were changed, and for some unknown reason it was finally dedicated to Lorenzo di Medici. Although Machiavelli discussed with Casavecchio whether it should be sent or presented in person to the patron, there is no evidence that Lorenzo ever received or even read it. He certainly never gave it. Although it was plagiarized during Machiavelli's lifetime, the prince was never published by him, and its text is still disputable. Machiavelli concludes his letter to Vettori thus, and as to this little thing his book, when it has been read it will be seen that during the fifteen years I have given to the study of statecraft I have neither and of my loyalty none could doubt, because having always kept faith I could not now learn how to break it. For he who has been faithful and honest as I have cannot change his nature. These and several minor works occupied him until the year 1518, when he accepted a small commission to look after the affairs of some Florentine merchants at Genoa. In 1519 the Medici rulers of Florence granted a few political concessions to her citizens, and Machiavelli with others was consulted upon a new constitution under which the great council... In 1520 the Florentine merchants again had recourse to Machiavelli to settle their difficulties with Lucca, but this year was chiefly remarkable for his re-entry into Florentine literary... His return to popular favor may have determined the Medici to give him this employment, for an old writer observes that an able statesman out of work, like a huge whale, will endeavor to overturn. It is somewhat remarkable that as in 1513, Machiavelli had written the prince for the instruction of the Medici after they had just regained power in Florence. So, in, in that year the Battle of Pavia destroyed the French rule in Italy, and left Francis I a prisoner in the hands of his great rival Charles V., this was followed by the sack of Rome, upon the news of which the popular party at Florence threw off the yoke of the Medici, who were once more banished. Machiavelli was absent from Florence at this time, but hastened his return, hoping to secure his former office of secretary to the Ten of Liberty and Peace. Unhappily, he was taken ill. The man and his works no one can say where the bones of Machiavelli rest, but modern Florence has decreed him a stately cenotaph in Santa Croce, by the side of her most famous sons. Whilst it is idle to protest against the world-wide and evil signification of his name, 
it may be pointed out that the harsh construction of his doctrine which this sinister reputation implies was un it is due to these inquiries that the shape of an unholy necromancer which so long haunted men's vision has begun to fade machiavelli was undoubtedly a man of great observation acuteness and industry noting with appreciative eye whatever passed before him and with his supreme literary gift he does not present himself nor is he depicted by his contemporaries as a type of that rare combination the successful statesman and author for he appears to have been only moderately pr he was missiled by katharina sforza ignored by louis kai i overawed by caesar borgia several of his embassies were quite barren of results his attempts to in the conduct of his own affairs he was timid and time-serving he dared not appear by the side of sodorini to whom he owed so much for fear of compromising himself and it is on the literary side of his character and there alone that we find no weakness and no failure although the light of almost four centuries has been focused on the prince its problems are still debatable and interesting because they are the eternal problems between the ruled and their rulers such as they are its ethics are those of machiavelli's contemporaries yet they cannot be said to be out of date so long as the governments of europe really on material rather than on its historical incidents and personages become interesting by reason of the uses which machiavelli makes of them to illustrate his theories of government and conduct leaving out of consideration those maxims of state which still furnish some european and eastern statesmen with principles of action the prince is bestrewn with truths that can be proved at every turn men are still the dupes of their simplicity and greed as they were in the days of alexander va the cloak of religion still conceals the vices which machiavelli laid bare in the character of ferdinand of aragon men will not look at things as they really are but as they wish them to be and are ruined in politics there are no perfectly safe courses prudence consists in choosing the least dangerous ones then to pass to a higher plane machiavelli reiterates that although crimes may win an empire they do not win glory necessary wars are just wars and the arms of a nation are hallowed when it has no other resource but to fight it is the cry of a far later day than machiavelli's that government should be elevated into a living moral force capable of inspiring the people with a just recognition of the fundamental principle machiavelli always refused to write either of men or of governments otherwise than as he found them and he writes with such skill and insight that his work is of abiding value but what invests the prince with more than a merely artistic or historical interest is the incontrovertible truth that it deals with the great principles which still guide nations and rulers in their relationship in translating the prince my aim has been to achieve at all costs an exact literal rendering of the original rather than a fluent paraphrase adapted to the modern notions of style and expression machiavelli was no facile phrasemonger the conditions under which he wrote obliged him to weigh every word his themes were lofty his substance grave quisio fut unquam in parchendis rebus in definiendis in explanandis pressure in the prince it may be truly said there is reason assignable not only for to an englishman of shakespeare's time the translation of such a treatise was in some ways a comparatively easy task for in those times the genius of the english more nearly resembled that of the italian language to take a single example the word intratnir employed by machiavelli to indicate the policy adopted by the roman senate towards the weaker states of greece would by an ally I have tried to preserve the pithy brevity of the Italian so far as was consistent with an absolute fidelity to the sense. If the result be an occasional asperity, I can only hope that the reader, in his eagerness to reach the author's meaning, may overlook the roughness of the road that leads him to it. The following is a list of the works of Machiavelli. Principal Works. Discorso Sopra di Pisa, 1499 del modo di trattare i popoli della Valdici in Arrivaletti, 1502 del modo tenuto Livia Feviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviviv
Fifty fifty fifty. Other poems include Sonetti, Canzoni, Atave, and Cante Carnationalista. Editions Alda Venice, 1546, Della Tertina, 1550, Cambiagi, Florence, Six Bowls, 1780, only published, 1873 7. Minor works Ed. Oh. Polidori, eighteen fifty two. Letter familiary, ed. E. Alvisi, eighteen eighty three. Two editions, one with excisions. Credited writings, ed. G. Canestrini, 1857. Letters to F. Vettori, C. A. Rydolfi, Pensieri in Torno Olo Scopo Diane, Machiavelli nel Libro il Principe, it's I. D. D. L. Sali, Lil, Lil, Liu, Sevel, Pivu, Pivu, Riu. Ferrara, The Private Correspondence of Niccolo Machiavelli, 1929. Dedication to the magnificent Lorenzo di Piero di Medici, those who strive to obtain the good graces of a prince are accustomed to come before him with such things as they hold most precious, or in desiring therefore to present myself to your magnificence with some testimony of my devotion towards you, I have not found among my possessions anything which I hold more dear than, or value so much, and although I may consider this work unworthy of your countenance, Nevertheless, I trust much to your benignity that it may be acceptable, seeing that it is not possible for me to make a better gift than, nor do I hold with those who regard it as a presumption. If a man of low and humble condition dare to discuss and settle the concerns of princes, because, just as those who draw landscape, take then, your magnificence, this little gift in the spirit in which I send it, wherein, if it be diligently read, and considered by you, you will learn my extreme, and if your magnificence from the summit of your greatness will sometimes turn your eyes to these lower regions, you will see how unmeritedly I suffer a great and continued malignity of fortune. The Prince Chapter I. How many kinds of principalities there are, and by what means they are acquired all states, all powers, that have held and hold rule over men have been and are either republic Principalities are either hereditary, in which the family has been long established, or they are new. The new are either entirely new, as was Milan to Francisco Sforza, or they are, as it were, members annexed to the hereditary state of the prince who has acquired them, as was the kingdom. Such dominions thus acquired are either accustomed to live under a prince, or to live in freedom, and are acquired either by the arms of the prince himself, or of others, or else by chapter I. Concerning hereditary principalities, I will leave out all discussion on republics, inasmuch as in another place I have written of them at length, and will address myself only to principalities. In doing so, I will keep to the order indicated above, and discuss how such principalities are to be ruled and preserved. I say at once there are fewer difficulties in holding hereditary states, and those long accustomed to the family of their prince, than new ones. For it is sufficient only not to trans. We have in Italy, for example, the Duke of Furra, who could not have withstood the attacks of the Venetians in 84, nor those of Pope Julius in 10, unless he had. For the hereditary prince has less cause and less necessity to offend. Hence it happens that he will be more loved and unless extraordinary vices cause him to be hated, it is reasonable. Chapter I. Concerning mixed principalities, but the difficulties occur in a new principality. And firstly, if it be not entirely new, but is, as it were, a member of a state which, taken collectively, may be called composite. The changes arise chiefly from an inherent difference. This follows also on another natural and common necessity which always causes a new prince to burden those who have submitted to him with his soldiery and with infinite other hardships which he must put upon his 
In this way you have enemies in all those whom you have injured in seizing that principality, and you are not able to keep those friends who put you there because of your not being able to satisfy them in the way they expected. For, although one may be very strong in armed forces, yet in entering a province one has always need of the goodwill of the natives. For these reasons Louis the Twelfth, King of France, quickly occupied Milan, and as quickly lost it. And to turn him out the first time it only needed Lodovico's own force. It is very true that, after acquiring rebellious provinces a second time, they are not so lightly lost afterwards, because the prince, with little reluctance, takes the opportunity thus to cause France to lose Malin the first time it was enough for the Duke Lodovico to raise insurrections on the borders, but to cause him to lose it a second time it was necessary to bring the whole world against him. One Duke Lodovico was Lodovico Moro, a son of Francisco Sforza, who married Beatrice d'Est. He ruled over Malin from 1494 to 1500, and died in 1510. Nevertheless, Mullen was taken from France both the first and the second time. The general reasons for the first have been discussed. It remains to name those for the second, and to see what resources he had, and what any one in his situation would have had for maintaining. Now I say that those dominions which, when acquired, are added to an ancient state by him who acquires them, are either of the same country and language, or they are not. When they are, it is easier to hold them, especially when they have not been accustomed to self-government, and to hold them securely. He who has annexed them, if he wishes to hold them, has only to bear in mind two considerations. The one, that the family of their former lord is extinguished. The other, but when states are acquired in a country differing in language, customs, or laws, there are difficulties and good fortune and great energy are needed to hold them, and one of the great this would make his position more secure and durable, as it has made that of the Turk in Greece, who, notwithstanding all the other measures taken by him for holding that state, if he had not, because if one is on the spot, disorders are seen as they spring up, and one can quickly remedy them, but if one is not at hand, they are heard of only when they are great, and then one can no longer. Besides this, the country is not pillaged by your officials. The subjects are satisfied by prompt recourse to the prince. Thus, wishing to be good, they have more cause to He who would attack that state from the outside must have the utmost caution. As long as the prince resides there it can only be wrested from him with the greatest difficulty. The other and better course is to send colonies to one or two places, which may be as keys to that state, for it is necessary either to do this or else to keep there a great number of cavalry and it. a prince does not spend much on colonies, for with little or no expense he can send them out and keep them there, and he offends a minority only of the citizens from whom he takes lands and houses to give. In conclusion, I say that these colonies are not costly, they are more faithful they injure less, and the injured, as has been said, being poor and scattered, cannot hurt. Upon this, one has to remark that men ought either to be well treated or crushed, because they can avenge themselves of lighter injuries, of more serious ones they cannot, therefore the injury, but in maintaining armed men there in place of colonies one spends much more, having to consume on the garrison all the income from the state, so that the acquisition turns into a loss and many, for every reason, therefore, such guards are as useless as a colony is useful. Again, the prince who holds a country differing in the above respects ought to make himself the head and defender of his less powerful neighbors, and to weaken the more powerful amongst them, taking care that the Romans were brought into Greece by the Aetolians, and in every other country where they obtained a footing they were brought in by the inhabitants. And the usual course of affairs is that, as soon as a powerful foreigner enters a country, all the subject states are drawn to him, moved by the hatred which they feel against the ruling power, so that in respect to those subject states he has not to take any trouble to gain them over to himself, for the whole of them quickly rally to the state which he has acquired there. He has only to take care that they do not get hold of too much power and too much authority, and then with his own forces, 
and with their good will he can easily keep down the more powerful of them. And he who does not properly manage this business will soon lose what he has acquired, and whilst he does hold it he will have endless difficulties and troubles. The Romans, in the countries which they annexed, observed closely these measures. They sent colonies and maintained friendly relations with two the minor powers, without increasing their strength. Greece appears to me sufficient for an example.